Welcome you all to today's webinar. This is our seventh webinar, part of the series on increasing affordability through municipal climate action. Um, some of you may already know this series has been focusing on the intersection of affordability and local climate action, co-hosted by the Clean Air Partnership, David Suzuki Foundation, Tamarack, Climate Reality Project, and Climate Caucus. Uh, so as you already saw, this meeting will be recorded, uh, and I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered. Uh, and I'll include a takeaway document there that includes this recording and the past recordings, as well as links to resources that have been mentioned during the calls. Uh, so just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Olivia. I am the network manager at Climate Caucus, a nonpartisan network of over 650, both current and former local elected leaders and over, sorry about my slides there, and over a thousand allies leading the transformation needed for communities to thrive within planetary boundaries. Uh, I'm away out of the country at the moment, so I want to acknowledge that I'm calling from the lands of the Huichol people. Uh, but generally, I am gratefully based on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, which include the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy, uh, also known as Barry, Ontario. Uh, so please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat as well and uh, where you are calling from. And in a couple minutes, I'll also share a link in the chat to a resource that um, helps map out Indigenous territories, treaties, and languages. And I also just wanted to briefly highlight before we start that one of our panels during the Climate Caucus Summit, um, where Tara Mazden from the Quimu Sustainable Solutions will share our latest report aligning local government climate action with UNDRIP. And as we know, Indigenous rights and climate action are intimately intertwined and local governments seeking to enact climate change mitigation or prevention measures can benefit from the millennia of local Indigenous knowledge. Uh, so we're really grateful we were able to work with Tara on this project. Um, and during this panel, she's gonna be highlighting the key approaches she identified in her research um, and then follow on with the panel discussion with three elected leaders. And you can find more information about this on our website um, under the events tab. So today's webinar uh, is going to be focusing on transportation, a sector that is a major contributor to GHG emissions and, and costs. Um, and so we're going to first three from three presenters, um, and then we'll have time for a brief question period at the end. So first, we're going to hear from John McMall the Can from the Canadian Urban Transit Association, who will be presenting on the policy intersection of housing and public transit. Uh, John is a director of the of communications and public affairs for CUTA, where he leads communications, advocacy, and public policy on behalf of Canada's public transit industry. And then after John's presentation, we're going to be hearing from two speakers that are going to be highlighting two exciting public transit programs. So first, Dan Hendry will highlight the national get on the bus movement that is building a network of communities that are investing in youth transit ed education and free youth passes. Uh, Dan is the co-founder and driving force behind the Get on the Bus movement. Dan's work on the Kingston Transit High School bus program served as the inspiration for the Get on the Bus movement, and his dedication and leadership has been instrumental to its success. Uh, and finally, Camp Councillor Wayne Olson will highlight the Niagara Region Transit on-demand transportation system that is providing an affordable and convenient transportation option in the town of Pelham. So Councillor Wayne Olson has been a member of the Pelham Town Council since 2020, and a member of the Niagara Region Transit Commission since 2021. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and pass it over to our first presenter, John. Thank you, Olivia. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, so, uh... Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me here to present. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss the policy connections between public transit and housing. And this is related to a new report that uh, CUDA, the Canadian Urban Transit Association, issued on the topic, and it's entitled Housing is on the Line, How Public Transit Can Help Tackle Canada's Housing Crisis. Public transit plays a critical role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that's why it needs to be a priority in Canada's response to climate change. Um, Olivia mentioned that the transportation sector uh, represents a significant chunk of greenhouse gas emissions, and that actually is 24% of Canada's GHG emissions, with most of that coming from private vehicles. 
Canadian transit systems work to reduce emissions in two ways. The first is by increasing ridership. Uh, with more ridership, uh, there are fewer cars on the road and less traffic in our cities. And when someone takes a bus instead of a car, they actually cut their emissions by about 77% per kilometer on average. Although uh, altogether, Canada's transit systems reduce emissions by up to 14.3 megatons a year, which is equivalent to taking over 3 million cars off the road each year. The second way public transit reduces emissions is through electrification. So switching Canada's urban transit fleets to zero emission vehicles can reduce emissions by additional an additional 1.3 megatons a year. Uh, just a just a point. Uh, a lot of people have talked about you know electric vehicle electric cars and what about them? Well, uh, they're a great solution, but they're simply not enough to reach the ambitious targets set by the federal government for uh, of a uh, 40 GHD percent reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Uh, since roughly 5% of vehicles are replaced each year, it can take many years for electric cars to be adopted by most households. Shifting people out of their cars and onto public transit is something that we can actually do immediately um, without waiting decades for there to be a net positive for the environment. So a transition that includes public transit as a climate solution is less costly and more equitable than a solution that relies heavily on electric cars. And unlike electric cars, investing in transit out also decongests our growing cities, which has countless economic benefits. But we've seen other issues, namely affordability and housing take center stage in Canada. So right now, there is an affordability crisis in our country. Housing and transportation are the two largest household costs for Canadian families. High housing costs in cities are pushing Canadians to move further and further away, which is leading to further commutes and higher transport uh, transit operating costs. Housing unaffordability poses a significant challenge for transit agencies, because if people can't afford to live near transit, then transit agencies will struggle to attract ridership. The latest data from CMHC underscores this uh, daunting predict projection. To accommodate the influx of new Canadians, an additional 3.5 million housing units are required, and that's on top of what's already expected to be built. Specifically, Ontario and British Columbia are experiencing the brunt of this housing shortfall, with a combined 60% of the deficit attributed to these provinces. Uh, and the re repercussions of that deficit are far-reaching. They extend beyond you know, the aspirational goal of home ownership into you know, the practical realm of re the rental market. Uh, the, same, uh, the same report from CMHC found rental market affordability for low-income Canadians is critically low. And much of this uh, housing shortage is in uh, Canada's largest cities. And a big gap that we have right now is that housing and transit are often planned separately. Uh, that means that when we get new housing developments with little to no transit service, or we might get new transit projects without the necessary residential density to, to support high ridership. And this increases the cost for everyone and it's a missed opportunity to build more affordable housing near high quality public transit. Uh, but we do have an opportunity to close that gap. The, the Canadian Urban Transit Association, CUDA, we believe that uh, public transit can play a key role in boosting housing supply and creating more sustainable cities. So in our, in our study that I mentioned at the top, housing is on the line, we developed a, uh, a series of recommendations for each level of government on how we could build more homes near transit in a way that increases uh, housing supply, improves affordability, reduces emissions, and creates more sustainable cities. We wanted to uh, focus on where various governments are currently focused and underscore how transit can help so we can achieve those co-benefits, including GHG emissions reduction. So we engaged, uh, you don't need to read everything on the slide, but just to uh, illustrate, oh, my apologies. We engaged with over 200 participants from diverse sectors, including municipal planning agencies, uh, uh, transit agencies, development firms, academia, uh, to provide feedback on the recommendations. And we convened an expert advisory board to provide guidance and insights, uh, ensuring that each recommendation is both evidence-based and viable. Uh, the report underscores the need for cohesive action and alignment between federal, provincial, and municipal governments. And although there are recommendations for all levels of government, we recognize the role of the federal government, not just as a policy initiator, 
but as a facilitator of multi-level government collaboration. In the end, we developed 17 recommendations across five policy themes, and I'm going to walk you through those themes uh, now. So our first theme is activating land. We need to activate the land near transit stations. That's, uh, there's a wealth of underutilized land surrounding transit stations that can be harnessed to deliver more transit-oriented housing. By unlocking the potential of this underutilized land, we can add to the housing supply while maximizing our existing transit infrastructure and grow ridership. So this includes making it easier for municipalities to acquire land around transit stations, uh, addressing speculation near transit stations, and prioritizing intensification uh, and densification in existing transit accessible areas. Our second theme is to evolve the mandate of transit authorities so that transit agencies actively encourage housing development on transit properties. So this includes convening, uh, converting park and ride lots to housing and building directly on top of transit stations so that people can, uh, can have convenient access to the bus or rapid transit or light rail or heavy rail. Uh, for example, uh, PCI Developments in, uh, is constructing 39-story mixed-use tower in Vancouver, including 226 rental homes, uh, rental units, of which 44 will be below market rent, uh, rents, uh, 100,000 square feet of job space, as well as a much-needed neighborhood grocery store and retail space. And at the base of the tower, they're also constructing an entrance to a new transit station, which is the, the first time a primary station entrance has been fully integrated into a ground up development in Vancouver. And we hope this will set a precedent for future, future transit oriented developments. Uh, the goal is to ensure that transit investment is met with land use decisions, uh, providing housing, job space, community amenities where they're most easily accessed. So in Toronto, for example, Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinx are building transit-oriented communities around stations uh, for the new Ontario line. Um, for instance, at Queen and Spadina, uh, there will be more housing, more retail space for businesses, uh, convenient access to transit, including streetcar and the Ontario line subway. Uh, and transit-oriented communities are part of the plan to build new sustainable transit by placing more housing and jobs and near transit stations along those priority routes. So we're seeing great moves on that front in Ontario, in British Columbia, as well as in Quebec, in, in Montreal specifically. So theme three is ensuring inclusivity. Uh, when we build more homes near transit, we also create an opportunity to make life more affordable and more accessible for all Canadians. So people who are dependent on transit the most need homes cl close to transit. This includes youth, seniors, low-income households, new Canadians, and frontline essential workers who work in food, hospitality, and of course in transport, transportation. Public transit offers a reliable and affordable transportation option that can significantly benefit these groups. We need to incentivize more affordable housing near transit, including purpose-built rentals and non-market housing so that more people can access transit. Uh, the non-market housing specifically because as new transit uh, is built up, it can often price out people out of a community. So we want to make sure that there's some protection for that. In Calgary, for example, the Calgary Housing Company has built an affordable housing development on municipally owned land, uh, about 600 meters from a light rail transit station. And one quarter of the units have subsidized rent. One quarter of the rents are tied to income and one half are at low end of, at the low end of the market. And proximity to transit was a site selection criteria that transit provide residents access to jobs and, and amenities. But we need to increase housing supply across all of Canada. And uh, how can we do this? We need to start with uh, simply allowing more housing units uh, near transit. And this requires proactive rezoning so that more housing is permitted near transit. And this also requires accelerating the timeline for reviewing development applications 
within defined transit oriented development areas. And this is, this is huge. This is a priority and uh, unlocking that potential in a timely manner is, is of the utmost importance. And that's what we've heard from the development community as well. There are a number of developers that are on board with the transit oriented uh, community approach. It's, it's the, uh, the zoning and regulations that are, is a, a major hindrance. And finally, our, our, our fifth theme is that we need to maximize our investments so that with the same amount of public money, we can achieve more policy outcomes. Funding for transit projects should prioritize those that stimulate housing developments, integrate with active transportation networks, and create complete communities. Uh, our report also looks at novel concepts such as uh, location efficient mortgage offers for home purchasers purchases that are near transit. And, uh, and this report also explores how to build the best ridership potential as housing developments are completed. So for example, when a new rail line like in Calgary's Green Line are completed, we need a strategy to maximize long-term ridership potential. And this can include funding for operation costs in addition to the infrastructure capital costs uh, to ensure a high frequency of service during the first few years as ridership is built up. Often we find uh, new transit lines take a while to build ridership um, and it's kind of a chicken and egg. You need to have reliable and frequent service for the ridership to come, but it doesn't uh, generate the fare revenue uh, initially. So you need to have that uh, assistance at the beginning of, of the launch. Um, but above all, transit agencies and all levels of government need to come together and overcome the barriers that prevent more housing near transit. Uh, one way to do this is through supportive policy agreements uh, or SPAs. They're currently being used in metro, the Metro Vancouver area. The SPAs are a great tool that uh, TransLink, which is the, uh, the transit agency in the Metro uh, Vancouver area, has developed. Um, the parties to the agreement are the province, the municipalities, as well as TransLink. And that it really helps to coordinate planning in station areas, achieving, achieving greater densities and mixed use development, including more housing. Uh, some, of, some of you may, may know about the Permanent Public Transit Fund, which is a new federal program slated uh, for 2026. It represents a significant, um, a significant potential source of support. It offers a st uh, stability and predictability to transit funding, enabling long-term planning and cost-effective investments in transit infrastructure. Uh, the government has signaled that, um, that integrating housing supply considerations will be an important co-benefit of the program. Um, their other co-benefits are uh, GHD reduction and ensuring social inclusion through transit. But uh, the housing one is, is of importance to this specific report. And the re recommendations in our report provide a framework for how we can all come together at the intersection of trans transit and housing and build uh, cities that work. So it takes more than recommendations to create change. It requires concrete collaborative efforts from all levels of government and our partners. And our report identifies which levels of government uh, are responsible for implementing each recommendation ensuring clear accountability, and then providing us at uh, CUDA with a roadmap for advocacy, government relations, how we engage with all the different levels of government, and how we empower our transit agency partners across Canada to advocate in their areas as well. So we we do have a housing crisis, but it, every crisis uh, has, there's, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And right now we have an opportunity to build um, cities where everyone can find a home, where people can easily get to where they need to go and where quality of life is second to none. And as the world struggles with uh, increasing temperatures, rising emissions and the need to address cl uh, climate change, we know that public transit can play a major role for our future. Oh, did I lose my slide? Apologies. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, so Canada has been at the forefront of setting strong climate goals and highlighting the importance of making 
the transition to green economy, which includes prioritizing public transit. Uh, in order to reach our climate targets, investments in transit need to be at the center of the discussion. And that is why finding the center of the discussion right now, it's it's housing, it's affordability, and we're, we're making sure transit is in there in as part of the discussion. And, uh, and with that, I encourage you to visit uh, CUDA's website, uh, cudaactu.ca, uh, to view the report, which is called Housing on the Line. It's on the, the homepage. And uh, I want to thank you all for your time, and uh, thank you for having me today. Great. Thank you so much, John, for your presentation, for helping to highlight those intersections of the sectors and, and those policy recommendations. Um, just so everyone knows, I will be including the link to that report in our webinar takeaway document. Um, I will keep us going now. Uh, thanks, Dan, for sharing your screen. And we'll get going into some case studies. So we'll start off with Dan Hendry, who's going to, again, talk about the Get on the Bus movement. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Olivia. I can't see anyone right now, just the way it's set up. So please, if you need to uh, speak into me, please. Uh, my name is Dan Hendry, and I'm here with uh, Get on the Bus movement. And it's a it's a it's a project driven by a, a national charity in Toronto called uh, Small Change Fund. And so I'm the co-founder and project director, and I'd like to talk to you through a little bit of the story of my life that got to the point where we are, and I hope uh, there's some learning with that. The agenda today, we'll go through what we've established in Kingston, Ontario, and that's where I'm calling from. Uh, a little bit about some of uh, the recognition and also resources available that were created, a tie to affordability, I'm um, working with youth uh, transit and then the catalyst of get on the bus, which is the national movement that I, I'm working on uh, with a uh, small change fund. Uh, so to start here, uh, it's just kind of a little bit of what we've seen over the years where, you know, I don't represent Kingston Transit itself. I worked with them for years. I do work part time with the local school board as well. And this is just an initiative that's created that we've created that's worked quite well. We've refined over time. We continue to tool. And it's a relationship between uh, the municipality, the transit authority and the schools in the area. And so this is the type of the things that we've seen um, other communities kind of asking us questions. And that's why, you know, I've been passionate and created the Get on the Bus movement with Small Change Fund. Starting back in this way more hair in 2012 uh, than what you're seeing currently, it started with, um, with just uh, an idea just for grade nines to ride for free. And I worked for the school board and transit at the time. And so this is a bit of that timeline. So by 2015, 16, all grades in the city of Kingston uh, are allowed to ride for free. And I'll talk about that. There was a really strategic fare change that, again, we just learned from. And I'll talk a little bit about more integration of youth on the transit system. And as we continue after COVID, I don't have that, that continuing on, but numbers are getting back up there. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about the story now. So it did start in 2012 when city officials uh, and the school board trustees kind of thought, well, how about we let just grade nines ride for free? And so lucky enough, I'd kind of come back from a master's in Sweden in sustainability. And I saw this as a great opportunity. So I went to the director of education at the time and I said, you know, it's great that we're allowing for this, but maybe the teachers aren't showing or their parents aren't showing them. Kingston's a mid-sized community, right? And so could we create an opportunity to show them how to ride the bus? And so sometimes I think that when I say training, it's not just about how to put your bike on, how to stop, it's building confidence. It's getting them at the same time to learn together because you find early adopters that can help train each other. It's building that culture. It's talking about the benefits that they'll get from it when volunteering or work or accessibility, right? And so so that's what we do. We actually, over the years, have now every fall take a City of Kingston bus to all of our high schools in the area, um, uh, in, including, you know, public, public Catholic, French public, French Catholic, homeschool, you know, get, get passes as well, um, and private school, because it is, it is administered by the City of Kingston. Um, but we train them, and we talk about them, and we show them. And what we've seen over time, and why I'm very passionate about this as a climate advocate, is my firsthand experience, the last 12 years um, of my life, it's not something I, I thought I was, I knew what I was doing until it's happening, right? And what we see here, that first year, that first cohort, there are about 28,000 grade nine rides. Well, year after year, after we got grade nine, 10, 11, and 12, we've seen upwards of five to 600,000 rides per year in the city, you know? And so in 2017, a young woman named Veronica Sullivan out of the University of Waterloo created a master's thesis on this. And what I thought was really funny and why I continue to talk about this uh, and why we're supporting others um, is because we see that grade 12 students use it on average three times more than grade nines. And as I heard earlier, which is totally true, it's a chicken and egg game with ridership. You need good transit to get more people, but you need more people to drive better transit routes, right? And so this is a good way. Youth bring 
life to a transit system. And what we've seen is youth can talk to their parents, bring their teachers, right, and normalize it. And they don't have access to an automobile until 16. And a lot of our communities are built sprawlingly around that, right? And so the other passion of catalyzing to get on the bus is that in this report, it said this is a great opportunity to stimulate travel independence for youth and grow ridership for mid-sized North American cities. And so that itself in 2017 kind of hit me hard personally as of some of the passion of climate. Another thing, not totally knowing what we're getting into at the time, but is you'll see here a couple of things. One is that high school students in the city of Kingston, uh, 15 to 21 will get free access. There's also a youth category. So after high school, up to 24, there's a monthly paid ride. And that's important because I can tell you since 2017, there's been an increase in monthly paid ridership, monthly paid ridership of 140% increase, showing that we're normalizing behavior and we're producing transit ridership, okay? The other thing with that is a zero to 14 ride for free in the city of Kingston as well. And I always love saying free because to me, it's about um, access and the growth of what it's doing. And as you can see here, this is a, a kindergarten class to show that it can be used, you know, and this is a pre-existing bus with other people, with uh, supervisors in the relationship in the city of Kingston between nine to uh, six to 900 field trips can happen on a bus on pre-existing routes during the day, which again, for these mid-sized communities, the transit systems day is a bit more of a trough compared to building the transit from the before and after school and work. And so these are some of the youth transit program created below. We have got some recognition, which is great. But why I really say this is because of an award we won from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, we actually got to collaborate. And so there's a resource that exists. If you want this, I can send it to you, no problem. It's on the website as well. Um, it's, it's a French and English guide on how to kind of replicate this program, of course, to being and normalizing it to whatever community you're calling in from or watching from. Another resource that exists is not just highlighting this, but it's a nine minute talk I did at the, for a TEDx talk in Ottawa. Again, this is a, a video that you can share around if you wanna see the full picture of what we've done. Another opportunity that we saw, another resource that exists, um, was actually a climate reality project. This was chosen as a top 10 international solution about normalizing transit young to then grow ridership. You know, we need more riders on the bus. And as we electrify our fleets, greenhouse gas emissions can go down, right? And so I want to talk about affordability because that's what this is about, that nexus between climate and affordability. Roughly what I've always seen, you know, a headline almost every year for years is roughly 50% of Canadians live paycheck to paycheck. That's very real. You know, 50%, it doesn't matter where you are. When you look at the houses, we, inside our houses, it could be, it could be, we're, we're, we're struggling, you know, and I fundamentally believe and what I've seen locally is that transit has an amazing opportunity for, for opportunity, whether that's upstream affordability, like creating more opportunities, better access, or downstream, just saving people money where they need it. You know, And so this is a report from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities put out in 2019. It says, you know, 1.5 1. Canadians spend more than two hours a day commuting daily, right? That's time. What's that worth, right? The average household spends about $12,000 annually on transportation, and $10,000 um, can, can, can be attributed to savings for households that contribute by, by, uh, by transit. And this is something I talked to students about during that training piece about not just autonomy and getting around the community, but also about the fact that they can get the job maybe they want to get to because they have access to it. You know, they save money in their parents' time or caregiver's time by being able to play sports later, getting that autonomy of how to use the transit system. There's no more pride. I've never, I don't have any, I'm doing this because I have to, you know? And what I mean by that is I don't, this is Dan Hendry's biggest influence on what I can do for reducing greenhouse gases. And I kind of walked into it in 2012. And so I'm always advocating for what this can do. Another thing looking at uh, the transit effects on people with low income, again, better access to employment and healthcare, access to safe spaces and for activity, equitable access to resources and education, 20 to 40% of people in Canada do not drive. And so, yes, that is, uh, could be age, income, ability, or chosen not to, but a good transit system connects community, gives us access. And I think now more than ever, we need to lean into community. The climate crisis is also a human crisis of what we've got ourselves into about how I think disconnected we are with so many things. Um, also, from what I'm passionate about is uh, equal access to experiential learning. Okay, and so this is what I get to see. And these are just some personal reflections before I get a little bit more into get on the bus, um, which is the national movement. Um, but I 
my my uh, ex account, I guess it's called now, I love seeing it in the spring and the fall, especially when kids are moving around the community more because they tag me a lot of times where I get to see it, where it could be students going to the fire station or swim to survive or getting to sports or the, the bottom left-hand corner is personal, very important to me. My daughter has autism and she's not in this, but knowing and working with her, she uses transit. And this is a big life skill. There are a lot of people that might not even have the ability to use uh, to, to drive or might want. And that was the specific autism program going for behavioral intervention and, and therapy work at, at a local community college. So some of my personal observations tied to affordability is that upstream and downstream, the immediate effect of saving uh, parents money on field trips, the immediate effect of that student being able to access things that they want to do, to say yes to a sport or to stay after school longer, to get the autonomy and understanding of that level of community where they're understanding how to get around the community. You know, I think that's very important. Sometimes I see my daughter put her earphones on and just sit in the back seat, not even know where she is, but on the bus, she has to know how to get around building independence, confidence, and responsibility, okay? For schools, you can see things like all these other programs that exist. Like I work in education. There's so many extensions of a school, right? It's about getting kids to trades programs or reach, or, reach ahead activities or field trips. It, it's not always 30 students. It could be 10 going to a specialized program, five, right? And so... This gets students out and about, again, connecting community. A lot of times municipalities too, not just the transit authority in some provinces like Ontario that is a responsible predominantly of the municipalities, but you know, there's other departments that look for kids to get to cultural events, to museums, to, to uh, Indigenous Day, which is a big, uh, a big opportunity in Kingston down at a park where there's, it's just moving people around during the day. And as students become more confident, their parents do you know, in them understanding how to use it. I've often known, and I've seen this as an affordability piece of just parents' time. What's that worth, right? Um, and then not-for-profits. I, I love seeing things like, Dan, uh, you know, now we don't actually have to ask uh, for the, the transportation piece so we can put more into the programming, right? So we're using our resources more effectively. And that's what I see with these types of programs is that it's not just, you know, we spend a lot of money from the federal, provincial, public health, school boards, you know, uh, that are channeled into youth focused programs, whether it be facilitating visits, you know, to cultural institutions, like I said, or enabling attendance at various events, offering free transit enhances the reach and the effectiveness of these programs, ensuring our resources are fully utilized. We're paying for a lot. We're paying for things, right? And so we're getting kids there in a built environment around the car. Okay. And so that is what catalyzes what we're working on driven by the small change fund. It's a national movement. It's a movement. Um, and so actually last year uh, in June, we, we catalyzed kind of a webinar and I appreciate the Climate Caucus and other partners on the call for helping spread the word of what we're working on. And our mission is to get youth on the bus for free and train them now how to use it. Now, the free part isn't always just on the municipality. It doesn't, I think, have to work that way. It's free for the kids. So we have to get creative as adults to figure out how that could work because there's a lot of benefit for that. And so what we do is we help communities develop part policy or partnerships or resources to create youth transit programs. And this, again, empowers young youth to choose transit, helps them integrate it into their lives so they become multimodal. And so part of this, the next couple minutes, actually, uh, this is from that webinar. I was able to get a couple students, uh, if we, I hope you can hear it. Hi, all. I'm Maeve. I'm a grade 12 student at Bay Ridge in Kingston. And so being a grade 12 student um, has, with my bus pass, has allowed me to balance school, extracurriculars, and work. And this really wouldn't be possible without my bus pass. My bus pass has provided me with security for knowing that I'll always have a safe ride to and from work. And in, in addition, the bus pass for high school students has made access to extracurriculars and learning opportunities possible. Speaking from my personal experience, I'm a member of the Ultimate Frisbee team, and um, my whole team was able to travel to our tournaments and games using the Kingston bus pass. Um, in the classroom, many of our classes this year have gone on field trips using the bus. So for example, we were able to attend the Kingston Film Festival um, with my English class. And and finally, as an environmental specialist high school major student, I was able to complete my um, enrichment activity at Queen's University using my bus pass. As the eco minister of my school, when I take the bus, I'm proud to know that I'm making a positive choice to minimize my personal impact on the environment. And then to conclude, without my bus pass, some of the most influential experiences and learning opportunities for me would have not been accessible without my bus pass. Well, I don't know how I'm gonna top that, but uh... <laughs> I had a job filming a local hockey team's games, and it was good to have the bus in my back pocket. I even have my bus pass here today. Uh, 
in case I couldn't be driven to the games, I would always just take the bus to and from my games, and that would really help me. Uh, I also use the bus to get to and from school daily, and I know many of my uh, fellow classmates do as well. Uh, it also makes it easier to hang out with friends. Uh, I've taken public transit many times to get to various places to hang out with friends. Having the transit card really gives me freedom and helps me become more independent. It also allows me to see my friends uh, wherever and whenever I want, which is essential for young and older teenagers. Uh, tra the training also is really helpful because, uh, funny story, one time my friend who didn't uh, go to training day because he wasn't there, he was sick, uh, he tried to get on the bus through the back doors instead of the front doors, but I helped him get on properly as I was there during training day. Uh, training day helps students understand rules and safety on the bus uh, that would they would otherwise have to learn on their own and it only took 20 minutes mm -hmm. and this one gets said a lot but again it's uh, the more people in public transportation means fewer cars on the road which means less emissions of traffic and let's face it who doesn't want less traffic <laughs> uh, another thing uh, is that it also like um, like Maeve was saying, it does help F to get to extracurriculars. Mm -hmm. Like my, uh, I'm part of the Bayridge Computer Specialist Program, and we went on a trip to uh, Queen's University, like the campus, to go see, uh, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was some research thing that they're doing. Uh, the fourth year students were displaying uh, their video game creations that they had done. So we, we collectively all took the 502, which is a bus that goes from Bay Ridge, uh, to downtown. We went there and we had a blast. Mm -hmm. Hi all. I uh, so I'll just continue on. I only have a couple more slides here. Uh, just to reiterate, um, with bringing the students in, I, I hope you could see uh, just what it looks like and why I'm so passionate about it, you know, and why I'm proud of what we're doing nationally. Um, so there's a couple of things, as you can see, it can lower the cost of school programs, reducing air pollution, GHGs, traffic congestion, making it easy to support local businesses. I've had some fantastic testimonials of local businesses that have students working for them and, and they, they praise the program. Creating lifelong transit users, you know, we need students to be multimodal, you know, and what I mean by that is when they leave the house, they have, they just have different options, you know, maybe not just to get in that car that also costs 10 to $13,000 a year to operate, right, and all the other things. Provides youth from all backgrounds equal access to life enriching opportunities, building confidence, encouraging independent travel, boosts participation in cultural programs and expands employment opportunities, increases access to community resources and services. By all means, I do not represent all of these communities across Canada, but I have been in contact with a lot or they've been inspired by what we've worked on and what I've worked on in Kingston. Um, and they're all slightly different. You know, they're different city, city sizes, whether high, uh, Halifax is working on uh, a high school based program. I know Oakville, Ontario has allowed for 13 to 19 to ride for free, you know. Um, and so my point, I guess, is just we're building that movement of collecting and supporting the uniqueness of transit and youth based transit programs that focus on getting it free for youth and then as well as the importance of training. And so I'll leave it there. My, my information is there, I'll stop sharing my screen. I hope everything could, saw everything because I couldn't see anyone um, and I'll stop there, but please feel to reach out. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk to anyone. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of this program and all the multi benefits of climate action, increased transit access, youth empowerment and so on. So thank you again for joining in and sharing about this. Um, all those resources that Dan mentioned, like the report and the website links, I will also include that in our takeaway document. And now I'm going to pass it over to our final speaker, Councillor Wayne Olson, who's going to be speaking on a on-demand project. So I'll just start sharing my screen now, Wayne. I think it's just loading here. Okay. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much. I'll start with my words. Uh, we are guests here and we should reflect upon the responsibility to care for the water, the air, the land, and the people who live here today and the generations to come. Let's take time to reflect on our privilege to live and work here in the community built upon rich indigenous histories. We recognize the nations and the people to whom we owe the diversity we're trying to protect here today. Through their experiences, we have access to the stewardship and stories of the many people who traveled this land for so long. If our actions today can move us towards reconciliation with the people in the land, 
then we should take pause and make our decisions with intention and gratitude. I am specifically great, grateful today for the Indigenous rights advocates across Canada who push on with struggles for safe drinking water. This is a struggle that all, all Canadians must share. Well, I want to present today to uh, specifically about our on-demand service in, uh, in the region of Niagara and to set the stage for you. Uh, the demand response of transit is growing because it offers a new, more equitable way to serve transit deserts. And that's what uh, most of Niagara region was up until two years ago. It's a shared and greener and more connected alternative to transit. To set the stage for today, Niagara region serves 475,000 people. We have four medium-sized cities you'll be very familiar with, starting with Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, Welland, and Fort Erie, and a number of small towns and, um, and hamlets. And the region is unique because we also have 14 million tourists a year to continue to, to visit the Niagara Falls, and they, they provide another $2.5 billion for the economy. There's a very vibrant agricultural and greenhouse sector that contributes 1.7 billion to the economy and employs 7,800 people directly and another 24,000 people indirectly. And until January 1st, 2020, 22, I should say, transit did not exist for about 170,000 of our 70,000 people in the Niagara region. Pelham, the, the area I represent, is one of 12 municipalities comprising Niagara region. It's largely rural area with two towns and several, several hamlets. And the population of uh, Pelham is uh, 20,000. But I have exposure to a, 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 um, a transit system of around uh, 500,000 people through my uh, membership on the Transit Commission. Next slide, please. As the municipality, Fellum has the usual plate full of issues to be addressed. And we all know that the state of everything has changed and many things will not go back the way they were before uh, 2019. We know that globally people over 65 are growing faster than any other age group. And for years, our governments have made it very clear that the policy direction is to support older adults to live and stay in the community as long as possible. And a succession of health and financial challenges have sharpened the focus and confirmed the wisdom and inevitability of this policy. But our citizens have an enthusiasm to share real life experiences and they encourage people of all ages to be part of promoting healthy living. We know the value of social network, social engagement and community friendships. As a municipality, we felt that transit would improve almost every aspect of life. Next slide, please. Thank you. Used car, used car and new car prices have soared in the past few years, thanks to a combination of supply chain disruptions, high interest rates and high inflation. Car insurance have, have gone up, uh, have skyrocketed, increasing nearly 14% between 20 and 23. And the Canadian Automobile Association now estimates the cost of car ownership is $15,000 a year for a standard vehicle. And that raises the question for retired people, should we really be devoting that much of our retirement resources to one activity? And we know that transportation as it now stands is beyond the means of many of our, of our users. About 90% of our fares are single tickets because the cost of a pass is beyond the means of most of our clients. And unlike pre previous generations, our gener Gen Z population don't see cars as a ticket to freedom or a crucial life milestone. In 1997, 43% of 16-year-olds and 62% of 17-year-olds had a driver's license. By, nine, by 2020, these numbers have fallen to 25% and 45%. And the average number of vehicle miles driven by young people dropped 
24% between 2001 and 2009. This could be due to the provision of active tra transportation options or e-bikes, or maybe their thumbs have become much more mobile than their legs. They are also much more likely to mention the environment as a concern. I'm gonna next slide, please. Uh, I, I've been in, I've been a chartered accountant all my life for the last forty seven years, and my and I tried to stay away, and I'm a little leery of tormenting you with a whole bunch of numbers, and I think I already have, but I'm going to try and drop the numbers a little bit now. Due to an aging workforce and falling fertility rates, there are more people leaving the the labor market than entering. Our transit has the support of the business community, but it, because it is seen as a way to connect people and the places they live with jobs. And while it's not necessarily the case in Neuro, in Neuro Pelham, about 40% of the downtown space is usually devoted to parking. And did you know that 17% of rental fees relate directly to parking? So if we can eliminate the, 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 car, the uh, parking at our downtown areas, it's an opportunity for savings and an opportunity to reserve, reduce or eliminate parking minimums. Next slide, please. 70 for 10 of people report better access to healthcare and schools. And the, the, the transit is serving to link affordable housing to jobs. Given the cost of, car, of, of ownership, access to a resource of a vehicle is not equitable. There's really no great way to downsize from transit. There's no practical alternatives. Once you are relying on transit, you're probably going to have to stay there. Here's some, here's some facts for your further consideration. 40% of all seniors at risk are at risk of social isolation and 50 are at the risk of loneliness. And 50% of non-driving seniors will stay at home all day if they don't have transportation. Retirement from driving can be devastating. Driving gives a, provides a sense of independence and a feeling of competence in seniors. But according to the Canadian Medical Association, the life expectancy often exceeds the time we'll be able to drive. In fact, for women, it'll be approximately nine years and for men, 6.2 years, and they will join the, 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 uh, the ranks of the isolated and lonely if we don't have transit. Next slide, please. On the next one as well. Please, thank you. This is our uh, this is our our strategic plan, and I put this in here because it demonstrates that we're operating a fairly substantial uh, bus fleet with 156 buses, and we have 40 on demand and specialized vehicles. But the main point is that we were talking transit been a topic of discussion in Niagara Region for 50 years, seriously for about 20 years, and we finally launched our regional transit on January 1st, 2022. And our, our ridership has now um, exceeded what we were pre-pandemic. Pre and perhaps the, perhaps the most overlooked part of strategic planning is a review of things that did not work in previous plans. And the previous plans are a gold mine of mistakes and profound knowledge at the same time. But here's the structure of our plan and you can see we formed and right now we're consolidating, we call that storming. And then norming is going to be our studies of our, our new transit system and our new fare systems that, um, that we will uh, be, be undertaking next summer. The next slide, please. The dark areas were, were the transit deserts that are now served by on-demand services. My career has been heavily influenced by understanding of lean, lean production methods and Kaizen principles. In lean production theory, you come across the comparison of push and pull systems. The prognosis-based fixed route system, which is a standard bus system, is a classic bus system, or classic push system, I should say. The difficulty arises on a prognosis-based 
system uh, when it comes from the peaks and the valleys and demand and the difficulties in predicting demand. Overproduction and lack of flexibility and more are the disadvantage of a push system. And that's why you hear complaints about buses running half empty all the time. The on-demand system is a classic pull system and the advantages of a pull system are less waste and more value added. Pelham is investing in on-demand micro, micro transit, which blends the best of public transit with the ride handling's most popular features and the advantages of the pull system. And the next one, please. And we share a deep concern for, for older adults whose lives may be limited by caregiving responsibilities, finances, fragility, or social isolation and loneliness. We have evolved to need other people, but the lack of transportation and the growth of the internet means that 40% of adults over 50 are at risk of social isolation and 58% are at risk of loneliness. And lonely people are still very social people. They still prefer to meet face to face. And sadly, the human condition means that 25% of our lives will be with disease, disorder, or disability, most likely in, the, in our senior years. Next slide. And we are very pleased to be able to show our results today. We're very satisfied with them. Uh, the on-time percentage and the ridership numbers have exceeded where we were in 2019, and we're exceeding the Ontario, um, the Ontario rates um, generally across the board. Next slide, please. On-time performance, uh, even during the, uh, the recent solar eclipse, our on-time performance was 85% with all the people that came to Niagara Falls to see the, to see the eclipse. And our standard on-time performance is 91%. Next slide, please. And I would say it's relatively unequivocal that the transit use finds the approval of our users. 95% report consistently extremely satisfied with the service and they report waiting waiting only seven minutes for our, for our transit vehicles to show up in a rural area, which to me is quite remarkable. And my next one, please. And this is the cost of transit uh, on demand is $34 a ride. Um, and comparable to the uh, to the rest of the province, which is not available, but our specialized transit and our on-demand service will be amalgamated again on um, and in the end of June for with a tremendous savings in terms of people and costs. Next slide, please. And thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that that this on-demand micro transit as a service is easy to launch and even easier to adjust. To changing priorities along the road. Well, thank you. And I'm ready to take questions if you have any. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing another uh, program and this time also in a more rural context. Um, and it's also always great to have an elected member share a project that's happening in their community. So thanks so much for joining Wayne. Um, and I also did want to quickly mention uh, that in the follow-up resource, I will be including a new report from the David Suzuki Foundation and Leading Mobility Consulting called Minding the Research Gaps, Driving Change, and Transportation Planning Across Canada. Um, and in the report, they interviewed staff from various communities, including the City of Edmonton, on their on-demand on transit program as well. And they have some data there on how um, it better serves communities that need it. So we'll be including that resource too. Uh, so we do have a few minutes now for questions. Um, I'm going to start off with one that we had in the chat. That was for you, John. Um, can you speak on how you have approached Indigenous communities and urban centers in this engagement process? Uh, sure thing. Uh, so during the consultation part of our, our report, we held uh, consultation sessions in uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, uh, Calgary, Toronto, Victoria, Montreal, and then some additional online uh, sessions as well for other areas that we just couldn't get to in person. Uh, we did have representatives from Indigenous nations nearby, uh, uh, those, those areas, as well as urban Indigenous uh, representatives as well. Uh, um, and some of the concerns that we heard were uh, about ensuring inclusivity with with regard to housing and affordable housing, and also the idea of uh, 
transit-oriented displacement, which is um, as communities get new, higher order, better transit that brings in um, you know, new housing and often increases uh, housing costs and then prices people out of communities. So we had some, some interesting discussions about how to ensure uh, housing affordability, uh, you know, ensure uh, rental markets and uh, below market rate rentals and um, uh, protected housing affordability blocks as well. So that was kind of the crux of the discussion we heard uh, in, in cities across Canada uh, with, uh, you know, with part partners from the Indigenous communities uh, and, and urban Indigenous communities. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, next question was for Dan. Is TransLink considered a similar program to the Get on the Bus? Um, I'm not too sure. I mean, I know uh, actually there's a center of uh, family equity in Vancouver that's pushing uh, transit for teens for policy change, doing some great work uh, there in, in Vancouver. I would say uh, from my experience, uh, the full integration of what I've seen in Kingston and that master's report, larger cities, it's harder to do just based on the way of sheer capacity. What I mean by like, can they handle the amount of students at the same time on route? So that is something that has to be considered. I would say that Toronto, I actually did a delegation there not too long ago, um, and they're looking at just starting potentially a little pilot for field trips, just a small amount of schools, right? So I think each city has to look at it differently um, and then build resources and capacity as, as there, whereas mid-sized communities, generally there'd be more capacity, I would say, than larger communities. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, and there was another question in the chat for you, John. Um, I didn't see bus lanes in transit signal priority in your recommendations for municipalities. Is painting uh, in bus lanes on an existing road space part of what CUDA is rec asking municipalities to do? Um, and does CUDA acknowledge the importance of traffic evaporation? Painting in bus lanes? Uh, can you, sorry, can you re repeat the question? Yeah. Um, is painting in bus lanes on existing road space part of what... Uh, CUDA is asking municipalities to do. I'm not sure who asked the question in the chat. Maybe they want to speak. Well, on. I think I think I think it's probably about uh, priority lanes for bus uh, BRT. Um, so I mean, CUDA is very supportive of BRT projects. Uh, you know, dedicated lanes, either you know, painted on or built up infrastructure, raised platforms for for uh, for BRT or even uh, or more you know, more complex uh, LRT. Um, the focus that we had on our uh, in our report is making sure that those developments are tied to housing so that way those BRT routes have density around them to, to ensure that there is increased ridership. So you know there are, there are areas in you know the GTA which are getting you know BRT routes and but don't have the necessary density. And I you know I see that uh, you know in York region, for example, and that's it's an area where, um, you know, we have those routes, we have the BRT, but we need to build those transit oriented communities around them to help improve uh, ridership and get more cars off the road, getting more incentive to, to for people to take those those uh, rapid transit routes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, John. Um, and I'm getting one question here um, in the chat. What type of this is for Wayne? Uh, what type of financing are you using for the on demand system? Is it all public funding or are there uh, any private financing happening as well? Well, all the, all the financing is um, is uh, on the tax levy and the, and the municipality, but it's very low number. I think it costs each household or each person in the town, it costs about $110. Um, the beauty of the on-demand system is uh, you can change a fleet uh, if you wanted to change your fleet from, from um, say, uh, diesel or gasoline to electric, it's much easier to change a small micro micro transit system than it is a big system because the vehicles are smaller. And the other thing we're finding out is that people are, um, the driver's right there with you and the, 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 the vehicles are kept cleaner and better repair and they're uh, much more convenient to people and people enjoy them. But it's about one hundred and ten dollars a, a, a resident for for uh, for on demand transit. All right, thank you so much, Wayne. 
Uh, I'm seeing we are right on the hour, which is great timing. So I just want to now thank uh, everyone so much for joining the call. And of course, thank you so much to our three presenters for joining today and, and for your presentations. And again, like I mentioned, I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered with the recording and all of the resources mentioned today. Um, and just a reminder, we have our eighth and final webinar happening next month on governments for our webinar series. Uh, so I'll include that uh, link to register in the email as well. So thank you so much, everyone, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. That was great. Thanks, Olivia. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Dan. See you soon.